dear colleagues, dear guests, uh, well, welcome to, to the session that is a part of translation practice uh, in translation training, part of Translating Europe workshop scheme entitled Translation, Interpreting and Culture, Academia and Practice. I wish to underline that the event is supported and financially contributed by the European Commission's Directorate General for Translation. Uh, and what is important, now, nowadays teachers, uh, would-be translators as well as interpreters, realize that it's important for their students to be trained to meet the needs of the labor market. That's why the collaboration of training institutions and translation industry is important. To do so, the training institutions should equip students not only with the ability to perform and provide a translation service in line with the highest professional and ethical standards. Uh, the European Master in Translation Competence Framework assume, assumes that uh, the aim of master's degree programs is to teach a combination of knowledge and skills which will enable students to achieve the competencies considered essential for access to the translation industry and to the wider labor market. So this session uh, is devoted to the problem of academy and practice. And now I uh, wish to welcome our, our speakers of this session, Tomasz uh, Koribski, uh, Claudia Benarova Gibova, Matusz Gamrat, and Jakub Absalom. These are the speakers of the session, and now uh, I uh, give uh, the floor to the first speaker, Tomasz Koribski. Uh, he's going to talk about training in project management skills, a desirable uh, about training, and if the training is desirable element of university translation. So. Mrs. Koripski, the floor is yours. Thank you. Please, you have 20 minutes <laughs> okay. to, to present your presentation. Yes, I don't know, we're running a bit late, so I will make sure that I squeeze this in uh, 20 minutes. Can everybody hear me okay? And the interpreters as well? Uh, I hope so. Okay. My name is uh, Tomasz Koripski. This is... Uh, the faculty and the institute that I represent in Warsaw. Uh, the, the building is in the picture on the left hand side and the logo of the institute is on the right hand side. And uh, at the beginning, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers for, for having me here, for inviting me to, to NITRA. We had a great introduction from uh, Professor Gensler and it feels great to be in a place where a lot of the, uh, a lot of uh, the theories uh, and a lot of uh, practical considerations were born in terms of translation, translation studies. Now my presentation is uh, a lot more practical and I have to start right now to make it in within 20 minutes. So, at my university I teach interpretation skills and I teach translation skills and it's mainly that experience that has led me to uh, compile this little presentation. And to make sure that we are clear on one thing, I am not claiming that this is a new idea. This idea has been around for many years. Uh, earlier work and research in the 1980s on project management and translation was already published by uh, Menteri in, uh, in 1984. Uh, translation was perceived from the point of view of uh, service provision by uh, Guadek in 2007. Many organizational aspects of translation were uh, discussed by Risku, and Kuznik and Bert more recently. And uh, there have been a number of articles presenting very practical ideas on how to implement uh, 
project management in translation classes. One of uh, such examples is data from 2014. So this presentation is A, a compilation of those ideas, and B, uh, an extension, hopefully. So, to make sure we are clear on one issue, uh, this presentation is not going to discuss CAT tools as a way to manage your projects. Many of you who are practicing translators and teachers of translation use CAT tools and you are aware of the project management tabs in CAT tools. We use them to uh, calculate the number of characters and words and evaluate our projects and, and monitor the translation projects as we, as we translate. Uh, this is actually not my focus today. My focus is much earlier in the phases of, pro of project management and uh, I mean the phases of initiation and planning project. And these, I think, are the phases that are still missing in our translation teaching curriculum. So, uh, we have the initiation as the basic uh, first part of the project, then the planning, then the implementation, and traditionally all the literature that is the focus is on implementation. What do I mean by this? We go to a translation class, we give our students a task that is a real-life task, and we tell them, this is a real-life text. How would you go, up, go about translating this? Uh, and we ask them to actually start translating. And this is the implementation of the translation process. What a lot of us, and uh, uh, I'm speaking on my own behalf as well, what a lot of us have not appreciated so far that much is what goes on before implementation. And there are very many things that go on before implementation, and as time goes by, there are even more things mounting up in the preparation for project implementation. And there is project closeout, of course. But we'll discuss it in, in, in details in about five minutes, probably, hopefully. So I've asked myself this question, but actually this should be an affirmative. When I was uh, putting together the presentation, I thought, I believe in it, so maybe right now I'll just try to prove the case rather than ask the question once again. Uh, the presentation is structured around three basic questions. The first question being, why do we need project management training for interpreters? Second, what do we teach in terms of project management for interpreters? And the third question is, how do we do it? To answer this, let's go back in history. This is uh, Saint Jerome, and in his time, I may be mistaken, but uh, my instinct tells me that probably a lot of his work was translation per se, because it was such a huge job that was extended over months and years and years, and the translation per se was the crucial part of it. Uh, it could take a lifetime in some cases. It was highly time consuming and typically focusing on one area. Of course, uh, a lot of knowledge was required as always with translation, but typically it focused on, on one area or on one big work. And the technology that he used was what we can call right now conventional. So let's bear this in mind and let's go very quickly to uh, the 20th century. That's a, uh, a quick ride to the 1960s, let's say, when we used to use it as translators, typewriters, and a lot of our work was uh, with paper, with uh, printed dictionaries. And this is what we can refer to as the conventional mode of uh, translating. The amount of project management then probably grew when we compare it against the, the times of St. Jerome, that is, interpreters and translators were handling multiple jobs, multiple texts, and uh, contacting probably a growing number of customers and clients. But still, I would argue that the bulk of the effort was the translation itself. And the mechanical activity of typing in the translation as well. The research component was very time consuming because we relied on printed uh, sources of data, printed dictionaries, libraries. 
and the output was smaller, uh, less speedy, there were no CAD tools available at that time. Now fast forward again to today, and today looks very much different. On the right hand side you can see all the things that are available to us as, as translators. Uh, the PC, the CAD tools, the fact that we are more and more often relying on machine translation, that we are more and more often relying on, on uh, post-editing to produce output rather than translating itself. We work as part of teams, we work in virtual settings, we work for multiple clients at the same time, we juggle very many things at the same time. So, all these tasks mentioned on the slide are part of our everyday work. Uh, we sometimes even have to manage human resources, we have to manage costs, we have to think about our subcontractors, we have to consider telework and its limitations. We have to, uh, in other words, look at a huge amount of non-translation tasks. And my claim here is that this part of our activity is growing. And it will even grow to a larger extent tomorrow when you see that uh, a lot of our work or parts of it will be re replaced by machine translation. It already is. Post-editing is the next big thing happening in the translation industry. So this means that in terms of proportions, the amount of time that you spend managing the project and the amount of time that you spend actually translating are going to get close. And I don't want to give you the exact proportions because I don't know them. And they are, they are changing every single day. But I hope this is uh, the feeling uh, of all of us that uh, the, the component, the PM component is growing. Okay, so if we have decided already that uh, uh, this is important, to teach such, such skills is important because the proportion of PM is growing in our, in our daily activities, then the question is, what do we teach? And of course, uh, it is important that we uh, consider it from a practical point of view, also bearing in mind that our graduates will not always work for the translation industry. Sometimes they will work for other industries, but they will use uh, the knowledge of um, the knowledge generated and, and acquired during the studies in a different field. That's the reality. Uh, how many faculties and departments training translators are there in Slovakia? Five. Five. It's not a big country. How many graduates do you have per year? 820. 820 graduates. Well, I can understand maybe, you know, translation industry will be able to absorb about 15% of them. What do you think? Uh, 56 were unemployed at the end of 2013 out of those 820. Okay. And <laughs> wow. but, but of those who were, uh, uh, who were employed, who were in employment, were all of them employed as translators? 40% of them are interested in getting employment in translation industry. Okay, so there we go. Even if it's half, which what already would be a splendid uh, result, um, the other half goes elsewhere. And we need to teach them the language that is recognized across different industries. And that is why it is important in the what section to focus on the standard way of teaching project management. And there are uh, across the board uh, industry standards that are used from construction industry through IT to translation industry. And the important thing is to teach students uh, the terminology that is applied as part of this of these standards so that they can communicate. It's actually like teaching students a different language, the language of project management. And on the right hand side you can see two uh, logos of uh, the, the standards that tend to dominate on the global scene. The PMI standard, Project Management Institute, which is an American standard, and the PRINCE2, which is more of a European or, or uh, UK standard. But both are widely recognized. 
And there are more reasons to do it, because translation is a highly projectized environment. We work typically on projects rather than in as part of operational activity of, of enterprises. Uh, I've mentioned the standards already, uh, and terminology has been mentioned as well. And, of course, we don't have all the time available, so you should focus on the key project management areas of knowledge. And what are they? I'll tell you about it in a second. So what part of PM knowledge is crucial? Uh, sorry, I'm delaying uh, at each slide because this computer takes a while to display the bullets. And I'm just waiting for the bullets to come up and guide me through. Uh, so based on the questions that we as um, teachers, I mean on behalf of, uh, speaking on behalf of myself and teachers at the University of Warsaw, we will get emails from graduates who have just established their businesses, who have just become self-employed, with questions about how to do things now that they are out there um, in the market. And these questions guide us to thinking about the gaps in the curriculum. If they are asking us, means they don't know something, and means that uh, uh, we didn't teach them something. So, they basically, they, they ask a number of questions, and they can be uh, broken down into main categories. The first category is cost estimating and scheduling, prior to offering, prior to producing a bid for the client. Estimating the cost of project management of, uh, on large-scale translation or, or interpreting projects. And this will include uh, appreciating the fact that uh, if you have a large project, the cost of organizing it and planning it will be a significant component in the, in the final bid, in the final price that you offer to your, to your client. Managing virtual translation teams, that's another skill that is not necessarily taught uh, in our curricula, because we focus on translation per se. Managing communications within these teams. Um, also, looking at contracts. What kind of contract do I sign? What kind of contract is a good contract? What kind of contract safeguards my rights? What kind of contract makes sure that I can, uh, uh, that I can uh, uh, go to sleep without problems during the implementation? Uh, what are the risks associated with taking on a certain project? Are there any checklists that I can use to make sure that I haven't overlooked something in the planning in the planning phase for the project? And of course, you may argue with smaller translation jobs, translating one page, is it not over the top? Is it not too much? But the truth of the matter is uh, that not all of us get small jobs. Many, many a times we get jobs which come in different file formats. In different, um, in different forms, you can have audio uh, mixed with uh, PDFs, mixed with uh, uh, printed material or scanned material that needs to be translated. All of that produces a very rich picture of, of a translation project environment and it imposes uh, a, big, a big number of translation management related tasks on interpreters. Again, uh, to summarize what I've just said, the key part seems to be the cost estimating skills for translation, schedule estimating skills, and uh, basic contract drafting for, uh, for translation projects, also with risk management, including a, uh, a piece of information for the students during the, the, the course about the typical risks associated with project implementation. And then how do we teach it? Like I said, we can always look at the standards across, uh, that, that function across industries. And these standards are based on a very simple idea and concept of the triple constraint in projects. Every single project, be it translation related or construction or anything else, has these three constraints that need to be controlled by anybody who, who manages it. The triple constraint or the the project management triad it's, it's referred to. Uh, I think I've already discussed this mostly. Mm. What follows in the how question is 
how do we design the class to make sure that it is included? Of course, and this has been presented in, in many publications beforehand, uh, the case study, a simulation is a very good idea, but the way we can do it is not simply bring in a, a material into class and say to the students, listen, this is real life, let's go about translating this. Let's invest a little bit of time in preparing the students to actually tackle that complex material. So the way we can do it is we can, for example, ask them to form a team of translators with assigned roles, and these roles will be different. One person will be just responsible for, for listing the possible risks associated with the project. Another person will be the project manager, taking care of the totality of the implementation, but not necessarily looking at details. Another person will be the, the timekeeper and the schedule controller for the project. And let's ask people to simply talk about this task at hand, even before they write down the first word of translation. And this can be achieved if you give them something more complicated than a single file. Give them an entire project that is composed of a number of files, different files, different formats, requiring different level of intervention. And ask them to discuss it. And it will take time. We can also include a briefing from the client with the requirement, requirements for this contract, for this, uh, for this particular job, let's say. And uh, based on the conversation, the students should appreciate how important planning is and how time-consuming planning is for uh, translation projects, for large translation projects. And as a result of that, they will come to appreciate also the value of interpretation and all, of, of translation and also the, the possible cost of it. Mm, they will be able to better justify when they are in the market, when they will be able to better justify the cost of translation. The tasks that we can give to students is, first of all, make a decision. Is it a go or no-go decision? Are you, are you interested in this kind of a project? Um, assign the roles, I've already said it. Use, ask them to make sure that they use standard vocabulary, standard terminology, which you hopefully had the time to introduce beforehand. And that's another thing, which is um, the curriculum. It is very, I'm running out of time right now, but I'll finish in about two or three minutes, if you, if you bear with me. Our curricula are still focused on, and, and the way we teach, uh, and again I'm, I'm speaking on my own behalf, is still focused on, on translation per se, because we think, we, if I have a limited number of hours, let me make them work, let them work on something real, but sometimes that work may prove to be futile in the future because they, they won't be able to plan that work properly and to evaluate that work properly and to make a living out of that work. So. Uh, if you are given that, that liberty, you might consider spending some time on your course on just introducing the theory over two or three hours, the basic terminology, and then asking the people to plan the projects for a longer period of time, discuss them, and then you can be simply a facilitator during such discussion, not necessarily somebody who, who only controls the output, which is often the case in translation classes. I'm happy to share this presentation with you uh, later on. I have to finish right now, but uh, let me conclude with, with one basic remark, that the, the situation in the market is changing very dynamically with the advent of, of machine translation. And we will rely more and more on machines, and there's no question about that. M maybe literary translation will defend its position for a longer period of time, for sure it will. Interpreting might hold the fort for still a while longer, but translation is already there. Those of you who are using it on a daily basis know that it's already there. It needs very often just post-editing, and if you want to keep track of it, and if you want to keep your role as a translator, and the role of your students as a translator, as a specialist, there needs to be a way for them to justify that cost. To, to tell the client, I'm a decision maker on this project, I am a post editor and I'm a project manager. And what you're paying for is not the number of characters, but you're paying for the quality of the output, which is the, the consequence of my thorough planning activities 
of my decision making, my linguistic decision making abilities, and, um, and, and of my uh, technological expertise. I know what, what tools to use to deliver what you want quickly, timely, uh, cost effectively. With this, I'm afraid I have to finish. 22 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Karibski, for your interesting presentation. And now uh, uh, there is uh, room for, I would say, two questions, because we are very limited in time. I don't need a microphone. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. It, it's on the way. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, hi, I'm Thomas. I'm, uh, I'm a vendor manager in the company Exit Translation Agency Company. You've shown a very nice triangle with the cost, uh, time, and scope of the project. But I have not seen the quality there. Is it, is it to be assumed that the, in the scope, the translator will already implement quality. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It, it, it is a very good question, thank you very much. And in project management theory, depending on the, the standard that you are using, quality is inherent in scope. So, uh, according to PMI, scope is composed of quantity and quality. So, the, the, the Q and Q is within the scope triangle. So, of course, and that's actually the quality question is very central these days. And that's what, what will enable one translator to, uh, uh, to have the upper hand of, over other uh, translators, one translation agency having the upper hand over other translation agencies. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Yes, Professor Gensler, your question. <laughs> yes. I have a... Uh... Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. This is a very important aspect of translation uh, practice, and uh, I can't underestimate the, the importance of your uh, contribution here. Um, I ran a translation center for 25 years, and we had some huge clients, uh, General Electric, whose uh, uh, annual income is probably uh, worth 10 countries put together in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, the education piece is, is huge. Um, on quality, the, 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 in the United States, at least in the company that I ran, we did a quality control cost to quality. So that, that also figured in we would let businesses know that if we do this, we were going to have to put on a project manager. This is what we charge for project management. That will be in the invoice. Uh, you're welcome to go with a company that doesn't charge for that. My guess is that that would be your decision, but the quality will go down. And so the industry itself would sort of self-regulate that cost to quality. Uh, uh, when I tell that to a translation teacher, the, the quality of this translation is based upon how much time and effort went into producing it. They, so. There's the education piece of how project management needs to be taught within academia. And I think I love your, I love your approach to that. The education piece also needs to be taught to the industry. So how much work are you doing trying to educate a client such as General Electric uh, what this project management piece might be worth to them? Yes, thank you very much for the comment. Just a quick uh, a reply from me, or um, or a fo or a follow up. Actually, there are benchmarks, there are industry standards, and for example, in construction industry, the cost of PM itself, project management efforts, ranges from eight to twelve percent. And if you take into account the the cost of project in construction or oil and gas industry, this cost of project management is huge. Of course, in translation industry is much lower, but it can, but it cannot be zero. There's no way it can be zero. 
and we need to make people uh, aware of that and, and, and appreciate that as well. Thank you for coming once again. Thank you. Yes, the last Thank question. You. Official. My name is Robert Tilarik and I represent Agents. And we really need project managers, educated project managers. This is a really big problem for us to find project managers who is really ready to work with us. My question is quite basic. Who will teach this stuff in the universities? Yeah. A very a very good question because the assumption that uh, the assumption that a university teacher who has had a career as a translator or interpreter is always able to deliver that kind of knowledge is uh, it's a false assumption, I think. So you would uh, probably be looking at a collaboration between <coughs> experts from, uh, from uh, economic faculties, experts in project manage management, and also practitioners from the industry, like project managers who have run projects for multinational companies and corporates who have hands-on experience and they know the basic um, standard terminology because we want to teach and educate professionals who are able to speak the same language and you say you're desperate for project managers but universities don't produce them because a there is a lack of such educated uh, staff who can transfer the knowledge Plus, on top of that, apart from somebody who, from the Department of Economics who can deliver a very nice uh, theoretical lecture on project management and how it all began with the US military and so on, uh, apart from that, you need also practitioners from the industry, from translation agencies, people who run projects on an, on an everyday uh, basis and who are able to compile easy tools, for example, risk checklists or risk registers for different kinds of projects with different kinds of complexity and different uh, groups of stakeholders. So it's a, it's a big question. I don't have the answer, but I'm, I'm hoping that what I have said right now might be a, a little push in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the matter of the cooperation of academia and, uh, and practice, yes, translation industry, and more or less volunteers uh, from <laughs> translation industry to come to universities to to help teaching this project management because that the matter of experience more or less uh, more than the theory. Uh, okay, uh, let's uh, go further. The second speaker of this uh, of this uh, session is uh, Claudia Bednarova Gibova from the University of Prešov, uh, Slovakia, and she is going to speak about cognitive effective inquiry into translators' happiness at work. to you uh, my new topic that I have uh, embarked on, uh, even if I'm still at the beginning of my long-term uh, quest. Can you hear me well? Okay, thank you. So in order to uh, justify the choice of my topic, I wish to emphasize for a start that the sociological turn in translation studies over the past two decades has acted as a strong catalyst for interest in the figure of the translator and the issues of their identity. Especially after Chesterman's appeal for establishing translator studies, who is with us today, and with new transdisciplinary incentives from sociology, psychology and identity studies, professional identity of the translator has been gaining more and more attention. So far, scholars have been dealing mostly with the translator's habitus or translatorial cognition, uh, but there have been only few attempts to integrate cognitive and effective perspectives. So when looking for a niche uh, in a sociologically minded avenue of exploration, the issue of translator's happiness at work 
represents an under-investigated topic both in Slovakia as well as uh, abroad. It might be true that there are a lot of references to uh, job satisfaction or whatever you call it in occupational psychology, but there has been only limited research in translator studies. Uh, translator satisfaction has received only a scant uh, attention and even if there are a few scholars who touched on this topic uh, tangentially, uh, their research has never been uh, systematic. So uh, that's why I would love to uh, map out uh, translators' uh, happiness at work across the uh, Slovak social space uh, in the years to come, uh, focusing not only on sworn and institutional translators, but also on freelancers, uh, company translators and literary translators uh, as well. For the purpose of this conference, uh, I was uh, forced to narrow down my research focus, staying with institutional and sworn translators only. And my aim uh, is to examine the perceptions of happiness at work across the Slovak national and supranational legal translation landscape using Van Hoven's framework. And my goals are to compare uh, happiness styles in the selected translator courts and to identify uh, the translator's effective feelings uh, in legal translating using the uh, IWP effect uh, questionnaire. So I'm going to interconnect cognitive and effective perspectives in a Chestermanian and Hubsche Davidsonian sense, uh, uh, so to uh, speak. At the same time, I'm aware of uh, several research challenges that I'm facing because I realize that uh, happiness is an uh, elusive uh, philosophical uh, concept and it's a topic which is a crossover to psychology. And a big question uh, remains uh, whether translators are able to take well-defined attitudes towards their professional lives that accurately reflect their self-concepts uh, and uh, feelings. Uh, so let's have a look uh, quickly uh, at my uh, theoretical uh, underpinnings. Uh, to this day, there is no agreement over content or measure of happiness because uh, conceptually, happiness uh, has fuzzy boundaries. There are scholars who say that subjective well-being, a fact, or quality of life are more or less synonymous with happiness, but then there are uh, vocal others who say that it's important to distinguish between these uh, notions. I personally prefer to use the term uh, happiness at work instead of job satisfaction because it has a wider semantic extension to include subordinate constructs and it is based on active and energy-laden uh, associations. So my understanding of happiness at work uh, is experiential and data-based and I conceptualize it as an experience of subjective well-being at work that involves contentment, positive assessment of aspects of translators' professional lives and prevalence of positive over negative feelings. In accordance with Hebron, I take a hybrid approach to happiness uh, at work because uh, it is based on its identification with life satisfaction, emotional state and hedonism uh, theories. Uh, a crucial theoretical uh, framework for my research uh, was taken over from a Dutch authority on happiness studies, Ruth van Hoven, even if his framework remains virtually unknown in the Slovak reception uh, space. Uh, he works with two essential uh, components of happiness. This is hedonic level and contentment. While the hedonic level refers to the pleasantness experienced in short-term effects, contentment refers to the degree to which an individual perceives that their aspirations are met. This is a graphic a visualization of Van Hoven's conceptualization of uh, uh, happiness, which takes a form of a fourfold uh, matrix. 
And each of these concepts uh, was converted into uh, questions uh, in my questionnaire that I administered to my sample of uh, respondents. So in the upper half of the scheme, the concept of the laughability of environment uh, denotes environmental chances. Laughability of the person stands for the ability of the person to deal with the problems of life. And in the lower half of the scheme, usefulness of uh, uh, life uh, stands for the external worth of one's life. And satisfaction with life denotes happiness in a limited sense uh, of the uh, uh, world. I will get back to, to this uh, later. When talking about measuring happiness, uh, this is uh, nothing new um, uh, per se, because uh, there have been several popular scales which have been developed, like Oxford Happiness Questionnaire, for example. But the problem with these popular scales is that they are based on a very general of questions, uh, which are rather hard to be applicable to the translator's happiness, with, uh, the translator's habit, habitus, uh, which is really uh, specific. Uh, and the problem of the most recent uh, uh, scales developed by Rodriguez Castro or Sink and uh, Eggerval uh, is that they are based on incredibly long questionnaires that I don't find realistic for translators to be uh, filled in. So that's why I decided to adopt uh, IWP effect uh, questionnaire which works with uh, eight uh, positive and eight negative uh, affective feelings, like feeling enthusiastic, nervous, depressed, anxious, and so on. And I applied it to my example of uh, translators. Again, I'm going uh, to address uh, this uh, question uh, later. Uh, as to my research design, just because I deal with uh, translators, uh, this is a research into domain specific happiness, and I use a mixture of quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis. My questionnaire is based on cognitive and effective uh, happiness indicators, and I uh, work with two dimensions of happiness uh, in accordance with all this is self validation and pleasure. For my research, I used uh, self-report data from 83 sworn and 32 institutional uh, uh, translators. In my contribution, uh, you'll be able to read a poem on their uh, basic uh, profile. Uh, I'll just say that in a study which was a prequel to this research, I examined correlations between translators' happiness at work and their demographic rivals. and. Uh, parameters of occupational prestige, such as status, income, visibility, power, and appreciation, and the results uh, should be published uh, next year in Meta. So let's uh, focus on uh, research results based on Ben Hoven's uh, framework. The uh, concept of uh, contentment uh, in, in his uh, uh, approach comes to expression in the question whether the translator's professional aspirations have been met uh, at work. The most pronounced difference between the two uh, codes is that the sworn translators seem less clearly decided in their perceptions uh, of the fulfillment of their professional uh, aspirations and they have uh, more reservations uh, uh, about them. Uh, the translators were also asked whether they have a chance to experience a hedonistic level of happiness at work, which is connected to the pleasantness experienced in short-term uh, effects. Uh, the sworn uh, translators uh, here seem much more susceptible to experiencing a hedonistic level of effect at work, even if this uh, might seem slightly surprising, but this is connected to the way they perceive their uh, language work. Uh, the sworn translators uh, view their language work uh, as something which gives them a sense of uh, linguistic pleasure. So let us take a quotation from an anonymous sworn translator who says, I sometimes take delight in searching for a plausible legal equivalent of a term for hours, and I even like discussing its interpretation with lawyer which contrasts well with a quotation from an anonymous institutional translator who says, 
the monothematic nature of ear translations has been dragging me uh, down. Uh, moreover, the translators were also inquired about their chance to experience uh, instant satisfaction at work that comes from socializing or let's say from drinking uh, a cup of coffee and my research shows that we should not underestimate such seemingly unimportant moments uh, like these. Even if uh, the institutional translators show here a certain uh, improvement uh, in their cognitive assessment uh, of these uh, questions, in contrast to the sworn translators, they less often take delight in this transient uh, form of happiness, which could imply a hypothesis that there could be more reclusive personalities who don't like socializing uh, at uh, work, but definitely more work is to be done in this respect to confirm uh, this uh, hypothesis. Uh, Van Hoven's concept of the likability of the environment uh, comes to expression in the question how the translators uh, uh, view their working uh, environment. Even if the translator's profession has always been known for working in isolation, this does not seem to be an issue so much uh, for the sworn uh, translators. Uh, what is, however, a uh, startling finding is that uh, more than one-fifth of all institutional translators find working for the European Commission uh, a rather discouraging uh, experience, which runs counter our general expectations about their high-flying or affluent uh, uh, lifestyle. According to psychologists, feeling important at work can boost your happiness uh, threshold. A uh, positive uh, research finding is that the translators in both courts uh, feel as useful uh, individuals uh, who are quite well prepared to deal with the problems of their uh, translator's life. So overall, when assessing the translator's happiness style, we can say that uh, the translators in both groups achieve fairly positive uh, happiness styles even if one third of them remain indecisive about their happiness uh, uh, level. What is an important research finding is uh, that the translators in both uh, groups look for professional satisfaction in their inward oriented job aspects rather than in external orientations. So what matters more to them is having this ability to do difficult translation, or it's to increase in knowledge or in their skills, which thrills them. And these are the things which matter much more than, let's say, earning respect or fulfilling the client's need. However, what is a strong happiness parameter in the institutional uh, translators? This is salary. Uh, and we can just speculate that just because Slovak sworn translators do not have such a high level of remuneration in comparison to the institutional translators, they are compelled to look for the sources of professional satisfaction uh, elsewhere. In the second part of my research, uh, I was working with the IWP effect uh, uh, questionnaire. Uh, and I relied on Liu's happiness metrics to calculate the translator's positive and negative uh, effective uh, indexes. And when we compare the results, we can see a clear prevalence of positive uh, over negative feelings during legal uh, translating, which is a, a positive uh, finding. Uh, what is a problem here is that uh, I expected that I called uh, my sample of respondents in the state of being just uh, momentarily busy. Because if I called my respondents in the state of being permanently busy, then these answers could have been much more uh, negative. So it would be a good idea to eliminate uh, this drawback in the future by using a paired sample t-test to distinguish between the translator's timeless and episodic uh, uh, responses. I also found that uh, feeling uh, 
excited, inspired and uh, enthusiastic represent uh, the positive feelings which make answers of institutional and sworn uh, translators uh, different. Uh, feeling at ease, relaxed or calm rank among the top three positive affective feelings uh, during legal uh, translating. Even if the negative affective feelings are much less uh, dominant, feeling tense or anxious or nervous rank among top three negative affective feelings. A crucial difference between the two courts is that the institutional translators feel uh, two times less worried but two times more nervous uh, during uh, the legal uh, translating. So, by way of conclusion, I just uh, wish to say that most translators in both courts achieved fairly positive happiness styles, even if there are some striking uh, between group uh, differences that I discussed when uh, going through the individual charts, so I won't uh, repeat them. I will just say that knowing more about translators' uh, conceptualizations of their cognitive affective experiences at work can help us to have a better grasp of the professional uh, reality. And uh, I will just uh, round my presentation off by some directions for future research. So it would be relevant uh, in the future to examine the correlations between a translator's happiness at work and the strengths of background framework by uh, more comprehensive statistical methods, but I still hope that the gained uh, results could be used as a launching pad for comparative analysis with other translator uh, micro habitacies. I have also posited uh, some hypotheses which would be worthwhile to be uh, tested in future. And it would be also uh, stimulating to find out, for example, which translators, be them freelancers or literary translators, have the greatest propensity for experiencing the hedonistic level of effect uh, at uh, work. Thanks very much for listening. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Claudia, for a very interesting uh, topic and uh, also your research and presentation of the research. Uh, now uh, I would ask you to uh, to ask Claudia about uh, about this research more if you are interested in it. So two or three questions. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. Kalmachenko. So, a human being can be happy only when he or she... Oh, okay. A human being can be happy only when creating something. Or by a new way. So, don't you think that publishing houses or agencies exploit this feeling of happiness of the literary translator or any other translator? And how to counteract them. Uh, can I answer right now? Yeah. I think that when it comes down to literary translator, they care a lot about any respect or uh, any recognition. I have several friends of mine who are active literary translators, and I've noticed that what thrills them, yeah, partly about their work, is having their own translation published. Yeah, and they are thrilled about the fact that they have a book which they can open, and their name yeah, is simply there. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, when you mean that literary translation yeah, is uh, scandalously uh, underpaid, and there are just people who, who do it because they love it, uh, then the answer to your question yeah, would be yes. Yes? But how to counteract? Yes, the, the 
this is the, the problem here yeah, because uh, uh, the translators uh, seem to be so passionate about their, their, their work and they claim uh, I, I don't do it here for a, a livelihood, I just do it because I love a certain author and I would like to have uh, this opportunity to uh, have my translation published. But uh, I know what you mean. Yeah? If we don't react, yeah, nothing is uh, going to change yeah, in the foreseeable future. So sometimes I would say that translators yeah, uh, are to blame on, on their own. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and um, nothing more just now. Andrew, okay. um, yes, uh, Andrew Chesman. That was indeed a very interesting topic. Um, I have just one question. You are basing your research results on the subjective self-reports of your subjects. Um, how reliable do you think they are, these self-reports? Did you test their reliability in any way? Well, uh, self-report uh, data uh, are always problematic yeah, in a way because uh, we know that their reliability can be uh, questionable. But when I was talking about the IWP effect uh, questionnaire, I was talking yeah, about the danger yet yeah, that I didn't eliminate yet because I didn't use certain statistical methods like the paired sample t-test. Uh, yet, I just expected that uh, the translators, yeah, when they provided me with their answers, yeah, were in a let's say a positive mood and they were willing to participate yeah, in the research and they were in a way enthusiastic about what they were doing. Yeah. Even if I have to admit that I had uh, uh, trouble uh, getting uh, more responses because. Uh, I uh, sent several calls yeah, for filling in the e-questionnaire and in case of uh, sworn uh, translators, yeah, uh, I was uh, really, you know, uh, pushing them uh, to, to answer. Yeah. So, uh, I just hope that the, the answers yeah, that I got yeah, uh, represent uh, the, the, the gist yeah, of their feelings and attitudes yeah, towards what they do. I expect that there might be a certain positive bias yeah, in their uh, answers yeah, because the respondents who are yeah. willing to participate uh, yeah, were positive. Okay, Martin. Thank you very much, Claudia, for a very interesting presentation. I have about 100 questions I would like to ask you. I will try to make it short. First of all, whether you consider happiness, hedonistic um, uh, happiness of interpreters, for example, because Paula Gentile uh, conducted this fantastic research where she compared conference and uh, community interpreters, and community interpreters, although earning less, felt better about their job because they felt like helping communities. Uh, the second thing is that uh, you said that professional versus non-professional interpreters uh, you said that they are happy because they translate uh, in their free time what they like and so on and so forth. In our research we actually show that the basic change in behavioral patterns is whether they're professionals or non-professionals. And there's a huge difference in behavior of professional translators living only and solely on translation and those non-professionals who uh, have translation just as uh, side money basically. So there's a huge difference in, in, their, um, in their behavior. And, and, uh, and the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, you, you criticize Slovak Academia basically for not going into uh, uh, happiness of translators, but as you probably know, sociological training in Slovakia has been around for about maybe 10 years. So first of all, we had to get uh, the basic profile of translators and interpreters and have the market research and only then it was time to go into more details and thank you for going into the details because I find that very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and your recommendations. Yeah, I'll try to utilize them yeah, in my further research. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our discussion yeah, during the break. Thank you for your discussion, Marketa. Uh, has a question, but uh, no time. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the third presenter is Matusz Gamrat uh, from uh, the European Commission's Director General for Translation. And Matusz is going to speak about uh, today's translator, if 
today today's translator need to be an IT guru. Well, hello. Um, uh, first, I, I have to confess that uh, you know, the truth heals, so uh, the title is not mine, actually. <laughs> so, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I have to just a second to set up the presentation. So maybe a translator needs to be a mighty guru <laughs> in the end. So, my presentation is actually about um, language technology coordination in DGT um, and with another title, a new approach to increasing the homogeneity of digital literacy. And I had to put the proficiency among translators and their assistants after uh, consideration. First, I would like to start with uh, the definition of digital literacy. Digital literacy is a component of media literacy, which is actually interesting because I didn't know that, actually. It refers to an individual's ability to find, evaluate, produce and communicate clear information through writing and other forms of communication on various digital platforms. Digital literacy showcases an individual's grammar, computer writing and typing skills on platforms such as social media and blog sites. Digital literacy also includes other devices such as smartphones, tablets, laptops and desktop PCs. So, as we can see, it's not only computer skills, it's not only computer, it's uh, actually all cyber world included. Digital literacy, there are six benchmarks according to the International Society for Technology and Education and they are innovation, communication, cooperation, research and information, critical thinking, I would stress this one, problem solving and decision making, digital citizenship, which I think also, many don't know that it's part of the digital literacy. And technology concepts and operations. These benchmarks give a hint about the many benefits that can be gained 
by increasing the homogeneity of digital literacy in staff, translators, and assistants. Such benefits are numerous, but they all have one thing in common. is increasing the efficiency and productivity. Heterogeneity of digital literacy among staff. How can we determine if digital skills are equally distributed among staff members? Because you know, you can ask um, and you might get some answers, but you know, <laughs> you, get, you get many different answers, and which are subjective actually. Yeah. So, but um, there is no other way to do this exercise, but you have to first map the skills through uh, a self assessment questionnaire actually. Results can give you a better understanding of knowledge gaps so that you can develop training to bridge those gaps. Such an exercise has been performed in the form of self-assessment digital skills questionnaires. So, um, it's self-assessment based. So, as a starting point in the whole exercise. From a hetero to a homogeneous digitally literate, literate or proficient team, depending on which angle you are looking at or from, maybe both. To make this important shift happen, a new comprehensive approach was chosen at the DGT level. A new actor comes into play in the form of a new functional post and uh, it, it's been labeled or named Language Technology Coordinator and it's in fact a network of LTCs, Language Technology Coordinators, because for each language department you have one or two Language Technology Coordinators, which is a new function and I'm representing one of them, the second one is from the Slovak department and the second is Dominika Vlikova, who actually uh, came up with this title of an um, IT guru, <laughs> which I like. <laughs> mm. what, what's the purpose of language technology coordinators? Their overall purpose is to promote and raise awareness of available language technology translation tools and applications and coordinate training and support of translation staff in their use in the language department. The most important element in this coordination approach is the fact that it includes both horizontal and vertical coordination it has at the department level as well as between the department and the central level because there is a lot of central planning for digital tools, for translation tools, for workflow tools and this new step is actually combining the coordination um, and connected the central level with the level of the departments which is, you know, the, the uh, direct contact with translators. Functions and duties of LTC the functions of language technology coordinators is, uh, are uh, testing, integration and deployment of tools. And then, on the other hand, support and advice regarding the use of translation tools and applications, especially in connection with complex translation projects. So, uh, language technology coordinator ha has also contact, direct contact with the translator and can, can then uh, scale it up uh, the needs, you can scale the needs up uh, to the central level. Uh, for, for, the, for the exercise of mapping uh, the skills individual translators on, which are on teams 
uh, digital skills catalog has been created. Uh, it is based on the European Computer Driving License. That's a funny name. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I cannot imagine driving a computer, actually. <laughs> Like Tesla, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> a globally recognized ICT and digital literacy qualification. In other words, a computer literacy certification program provided by ECDL Foundation. And in, uh, for non-European countries it's called ICDL, so International. Which is a not-for-profit organization. So this European Computer Driving License uh, uh, has includes a lot of categories of digital skills, what you what you are supposed uh, to be able to do in the present uh, is in the present world actually in the present reality, and uh, which is uh, actually required of you uh, in order to survive nowadays. This digital skills catalogue uh, serves as a new reference point for translators and language technology coordinators in adjusting and planning future training. So, uh, there is a shift towards a new model of training planning uh, from central to individual, uh, so to say, personalized training for individual translators or groups of translators, maybe. Uh, I've included in this presentation some central questions from the questionnaire. Uh, so there are some, some, some things you will, will not understand or cannot understand because they are internal. But, uh, so that you see, for example, question number three. In EU relax, I can display the latest consolidated version of the legal act. Number 13. I know the difference between remove from list in studio, delete project, in the cat client. Cat client is an internal application. It's actually an interface uh, um, between Treadle Studio and uh, and uh, our databases. And delete project in Tradesk. So that's another um, internal application. Question number 21. I understand the difference between changing a setting in file options and changing it in project settings. So these are technical things. I know the difference between pre-translate and apply perfect match. This is actually, uh, in this context, it, uh, it is only um, for uh, studio, actually, because this is the main program that is being used nowadays. And there is a side note on a common misconception regarding digital divide. The terms digital natives and digital immigrants, where a digital native is an individual born into the digital age, can help better understand the issues of teaching digital literacy. However, simply being a digital native does not make one digitally literate. So, I want to point out that um, it is very often the case that uh, the first image you get when you talk about digital divide is the old, older people, younger people, but it's not true actually. Yeah, okay, so I, I get some space to uh, say the, in my opinion, things. <laughs> so, yeah. 
thank you for uh, uh, listening to me in this presentation. And I have a few takes, or if I, I don't know if I have time yet, uh, for students maybe. Selected tips uh, for translators from the standpoint of an aspiring pathophysician, which is me. Uh, thirst for knowledge uh, as the best driver for the wannabe translator, this is what I would suggest for translation students. How to translate so that no one understands is the second point. The third is making sure that your computer doesn't know you better than you know it. Uh, think about the ethics of automating translation. Remember that machine translation post-processing can help you lose your mind if you are into that kind of thing. Learn from fach idiots, but never be, become one. Never neglect your AFK activities, because for the time being you need your hardware running and in a good shape. <coughs> uh, thank you. Any questions are welcome. Actually, I think it is really nice that we have these two presentations uh, um, together. That we heard something about the happiness at work <laughs> and we see that uh, the translators and interpreters who are active now in the field, they really like to work with language. And that, that's the reason why a literary translator or a sworn translator working at the national level is really happy with his work also when he earns not so much money, um, I think. And if you uh, look on the presentation uh, that came next, then you see actually what uh, we all have in our mind, but we don't want to realize that the job of a uh, translator, and maybe later on also interpreter, um, will be actually to help develop the uh, software to run translations and interpreting in the future. And I think that uh, will have a uh, big impact on the happiness <laughs> at work. So maybe <clears throat> I would like to uh, ask you um, how, uh, how an important uh, um, part of, uh, of the education of the translator and interpreter now should be the, the technology if you want to work um, for the European institutions and how can we see as an uh, academia um, what is important to teach them. Your tips are, are really beautiful, I will give it to my students, but uh, uh, when you see how quick the uh, uh, technologies uh, de uh, are developed, uh, how what is actually essential to teach them? Because we cannot teach them the concrete technologies, because 10 years later you cannot use them anymore. So I see that you also see that they have to have a knowledge about using technologies, but what is the way how to give, uh, give them this knowledge and the uh, vision to develop their, uh, their uh, skills in this? Uh. Well, actually, um, the same problem bothers now you know, our management. <laughs> so, uh, it is not an easy question, really, but I think that uh, teaching someone uh, how to operate a program is not enough. We 
because, as you said, you know, programs will change, applications will change, platforms will change. So, yeah, diving into it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. There will be actually there will be a round table discussion in the afternoon about all this and what is in the Yeah, I'm sorry to <laughs> interrupt you. Uh, but I uh, uh, I would better stop the, uh, the discussion because we are limited in time. And uh, here is the last speaker of this uh, session, Yakub Absalon. And post ed oh sorry <laughs> and post editors <laughs> well comparison of different methodology used on online training of translators and post editors and Mr. Absalon is from Asset Translation Company uh, and uh, he uh, was a doctoral student. Uh, at our department and wrote his thesis on this topic. Thank you for introducing me. You look very hungry, so I don't want to make you look angry also. So I will try to do my presentation as short as possible. So let's go. Uh, thank you for organizer for the opportunity to talk about online training of translators. I believe that all of you have a lot of experience with uh, online training and teaching. So I do not expect I will tell you something brand new. But uh, what I would like to do is to share my personal experience with online teaching and online training. And also to share the best practices from uh, our company. The let's say, a middle-sized translation company based in Slovakia. I will go through three different methods of online training. Uh, I will go through self-paced online exercises, which are usually based on uh, uh, online forms with uh, multiple or various elements like multiple choice answers, checkboxes, drop-down menus and so on. Then I will continue with one-to-one -one online tuition, uh, which we use mainly for uh, computer-aided translation tool training. And then I will continue with webinars. Of course, I know there are many others and still emerging new techniques you can use, like web webcast, podcast, and all the stuff. But I will concent concentrate on the stuff I, uh, or we are really using in real-life scenarios. Why I am sitting here, probably the reason is of my uh, more than 15 years of experience of trying to manage translation company where, where I'm responsible for also for uh, training and development of translators, both uh, in-house translators and freelancers, but also development of project managers. And I found useful for this activity of, um, my previous experiences from a human resources department from company where I worked as uh, HR specialist responsible also for education of the staff and also maybe useful are my teaching experience uh, of uh, adult learners in different fields. Another why question, why online learning, especially why uh, it is useful for freelance translators? Uh, the answers uh, are quite obvious I think because freelance translators are spread all over the country or even better to say continent or even globe so to put them together into one classroom is always a problem they are always busy because they are working not only during the day but often evening, even nights and weekends so to find free time for self-development uh, and education is always a challenge for them Another pitfall is uh, inconsistency in their skills, basic skills, and their knowledge, and their motivation for self-development. 
So the flexibility of online training, uh, by flexibility of online training, you can create smaller, relatively consistent group of students. Uh, and the possibility to, to deliver your activity into their homes, directly into their homes and into their PCs. Uh, this is another big advantage of online training. And generations of translators are changing and for young professionals it is absolutely natural to use online resources like YouTube channels, Facebook and many other stuff and they use it also, not only, but also for self-education and self-improvement. And uh, what, another reason why they, are they have chosen a freelance career is sometimes also the fact that they are, light, let's say, light shy and they do not tend to, to gather in some social uh, activities and they prefer their privacy. Let's have a look on the first activity. I have chosen the one-to-one -one tuition as the first one because this is the most, uh, this is most frequently used activity online in our company. And we use it for computer uh, uh, translation to training. Currently, we offer two kinds of courses, SDL Trado Studio together with Memsource. In the past, we also offer an, another software. Uh, we offer it on, online, but also online, or we can say offline. Uh, when I compare these two courses, so the online courses are shorter. The reason is that I skip a lot of exercises from it, and we encourage our students to practice on their own. Uh, so they are shorter, so it is expected to be also cheaper, and that's the reason why, also one of the reasons, the people choose these online courses. Another reason is that we are able to deliver these courses also to the distance places. Uh, we offer basic training, basic kettle training, but uh, through the one-to-one -one online tuition we also support them. So there are some um, ad hoc activities, but we also offer customized trainings, which usually follows, uh, follows the basic training. Concerning the software we use for one-to-one -one tuition, we started with Skype, uh, with a Skype support. Uh, so it, it is nice to have uh, screen sharing, but uh, uh, soon I have realized that uh, screen, sc uh, screen sharing is not enough and you should use also screen control because it's, uh, it will, it's easier to, to manage the, the conversation. And uh, I have tendency to, to use two channels, one channel for communication, Usually I use Skype, but you can use any other software, and uh, another for, for screen, screen uh, control or screen sharing. I am using TeamViewer mostly because it is free for no, non-commercial usage, so for translators it's free. And so from the very beginning I realized that uh, it has got a very nice um, uh, response time and also the quality of the picture is nice. And for me, it is very easy to switch between two channels. And I do believe that I make uh, my presentation uh, more interesting for them to switch from web camera to, to screen and so on. I, I keep them alive during my presentation like this. Uh, I'm also trying to make or prepare some takeaway stuff for my students, like ebooks, videos, recordings. So also, you can use the recording of the training, and it works. Uh, we do not have time for the details what analysis, but uh, the most important uh, thing with one to one tuition is, that, uh, is the possibility of uh, concentration on individual goal and pace according to the needs of your students. And by rehearsal activity, uh, you can prevent some technical problems. Uh, usually, the problems are with microphone or camera. Let's have some tips and tricks. So, test equipment before the lesson, use camera. Uh, do not be afraid of using two applications. Uh, yes, I do recommend it. Uh, I forget to, to say that uh, in the past there were some, um, often there were problems with internet connections. 
So I've been using uh, phone for communication and uh, application for screen sharing. Give clear instructions and always check its comprehension. Customize space and content. Let's have a look on another, another technique or methodology we use and it's webinar. We use it for development courses, uh, we try to teach uh, theoretical materials or new features uh, available in the software, but we also use it for term terminology management courses. Uh, once a year, so annually, we try to organize small educational activity, we call it Pro Translators Conference. We started with classic on-site or uh, on-site system, and but uh, later we combine it with stream, video streaming. And last year we have organized it like a pure uh, webinar, webinar meeting. Concerning the software, we, we have experiences with click meeting, Cisco Webex, and go to webinar or go to meeting by Citrix. It's very nice to use market leaders, but sometimes you sh should take care about the profitability and you, have, you must try some other software. Uh, there are some pictures and uh, first, on the first picture you can see how we use uh, video, video chat uh, to, to bring expert lecture from Luxembourg to our small event. On the second picture you can see classic, uh, classic um, terminology management course and on the third picture, there is a combination of, uh, of on-site on -site presentation, which was st uh, streamed online. Uh, let's have a look on uh, the, big, uh, the benefits. The biggest benefit is, of course, to, uh, the ability to organize, uh, to organize even with a high number of attendees. You can even make some money from this. Uh, but uh, by doing this, uh, you are losing contact with your audience. So I do recommend to use camera view, try to make eye contact. Even in this case, it is only one way eye contact because uh, obviously you are not able to see two hundreds of your audience into the faces. Uh, use a lot of animations. So uh, that's the contrast with the presentation here. There is no animation and uh, change the screen view often. Tips. Test it before deployment and mine updates. It happened to me several times that uh, I, I was trying to teach uh, some feature of the software and uh, it has completely changed overnight because of the update. Uh, give attendees a possibility to test functionality of the application of the software, but this feature is uh, usually inco incorporated into the application for webinars. Keep the pace, mind the dropouts, because it uh, really resembles me the uh, radio broadcasting and three seconds of silence in radio are terrible. Use assistant for uh, ability to, or to improve the, your ability to answer questions of your audience immediately. Or you can uh, you can use two lectures. Prepare short activities like tests, quizzes, uh, polls, and try to answer these uh, immediately. So show the answers uh, immediately. It will engage your audience. Prepare takeaway stuff again. Ask for feedback. And uh, if you are short of time and you have no experience, maybe you should consider making use of a professional webinar producer. Also, in country like Slovakia, uh, uh, I expect there are not uh, many of such uh, profession, professionals. Uh, the last technique is self-paced online exercise. <coughs> I think that this is the oldest technique uh, used for online teaching. But uh, now I would like to concentrate on our relatively new stuff. Uh, we have developed some two and a half years in cooperation with uh, this university, Nitra University, uh, course which is sp uh, specifically targeted to uh, needs of uh, post editors. And we try to target specific competence and skills uh, vital for excellent, uh, excellent post editors. 
so this we call it split principle. It's very similar like you use in gym if you go to gym, and it's quite unique because most of the of the courses available are too general. That's the reason why we uh, we are trying to make our own course. Let's have a look on the screenshots from the web. Uh, altogether, there are 12 exercises, and we divided them into five groups or subgroups. Uh, uh, first activity is just application form where you get the data from your attendees. You can use it later for, uh, for recruitment, for example, but also for PR or marketing activities. The second exercise, uh, by, uh, the goal is to measure time and quality of the translation uh, from scratch. And the results are uh, compared with the results from the third exercise. Then there is a yellow exercise which is focused on decision making. And decision making is really the vital part of post editing. And the question is here to use or not to, to use empty. Uh, that is the question, yeah? so it should be a joke. <laughs> right? uh, then another uh, red group uh, of exercises. They are specific, each of them is specifically targeted in one type of uh, error made typically by MT Engine. It is usually specific for uh, language pair, but also for MT Engine. And blue exercise is, uh, we put all types of errors together and the task is to identify them. And the last exercise is uh, focused on uh, improving of editing skills of attendees. Mm. What are the benefits? Uh, the, these self-paced courses are extremely cost effective because you don't need no lecture here or trainer but thanks to this you completely lose control over your students and you pay the price uh, uh, with the, the fact that students uh, tend to skip exercises they do not care about the results and many times they finish it before the end so you need some goal-oriented person to, to conduct such a courses uh, some recommendation structure such this type of courses give clear instruction, test before deployment, collect data, so the very same. But what is new here, uh, try to connect with analytical application because it will give you possibility to collect another data. You can use them for your future research or you can uh, use them for making decision or improvement of your own uh, of, of, uh, this course. Uh, if you offer it for free, uh, use it at least like PR activity. And uh, the, the fact that you, you offer it for free doesn't mean that you should give it for free to your competitors. So try to protect it by password or recapture or something like this. Uh, use third-party resources just to make it more interesting for your attendees, for students. For example, uh, we were using uh, typing test uh, from our post-editors uh, test of course. And final, final, uh, final slide. These are some recommendations from me. Very modest. Some recapitulation. Test before deployment. Record your screen. Use feedback forms. Don't forget follow up emails. Uh, give takeaway stuff. Use webcam to establish personal contact. May frequent uh, short checkup activities just to check whether they are still alive. Uh, use assistant uh, for question and answers, try to attract attendees by showmanship, so tell the stories, give examples, uh, like in ordinary classroom activities. Use third party uh, links to make content interesting and make audience active. Diversify activities uh, and the last is to be systematic, at least try. This is the most difficult for me at least. And uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for listening to me. And maybe some of you will ask the, what was it for. So uh, maybe I would add one more, one more sentence. Use different techniques for different purposes. That was all about. Thank you.
Thank you, Jakub, for your interesting uh, presentation uh, based on your practice, on your experience. Uh, that's very valuable uh, for all of us uh, to do the courses of this kind. Uh, because we are overlapping the time, uh, <laughs> we are a half an hour late. Uh, just one or two questions and then you can ask Jakub and all of the speakers uh, yes, during the lunch the break. Yes, during uh, lunch. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, yes, uh, Tomasz Koripski. Just a quick question. Uh, you've obviously put in a lot of effort and time into compiling the, uh, the exercises and, and the activities. Does it make business sense? What's the return on investment? No, no, no. it doesn't no. make sense so far. So it's Concer if we are talking about the post editor course, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense. Business sense. Okay, mm -hmm. not so far. So you, you are just doing it for educational purposes? Uh, also for education, because it was a part of my uh, study here. Mm -hmm. So we put our efforts together with the university. We, pre we are prepared for the next step, but maybe my expectation was a little bit uh, different uh, than the real life situation. And uh, now I think that uh, there are not going to be some, uh, how to say it, some strict line that before the post editing and after the post editing, but uh, the translators are already post editors technical translators, they are using it. So now I'm changing even the name of the course and uh, I, I, I'm going to call it how to use machine translation during translation. Yes, so not post-editing because it's, uh, how to say, it's <laughs> It's yes, so It's for, for all the translators. So I'm not using it and so also I'm preparing the book how to use it and not be abused. Yes. Okay, thank you, Jakub. One more question and then... Oh, yes, uh, Martin, your choice. Thank you very much, Jakub, for your presentation. I was just wondering whether, because you said that people do not apply for post-editing uh, course, and actually the recent research conducted in Belgium among professional translators and interpreters says that only 20% of participants of the research actually witnessed the uh, post-editing machine translation and in the V4 countries con uh, there was research by Thomas Svoboda who said that only 3% of translators used uh, or were faced with post-editing machine translation in practice so did might be the reason that there is no such a demand in, in Central Europe, I don't the, the, the know. The so figures from my research is completely different, but I do not remember. <laughs> I'm not so good for like you. <laughs> I do not remember, but uh, I'm, uh, I, of course I will send you the results from our research. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And now, uh, yes, uh, you can <laughs> go for... Uh, for lunch break and uh, and the break uh, is up to 1 p.m. So I, I would say uh, uh, 1 and something, yes, because uh, there are only 20 minutes to 1. Thank you all for your presentations you. and for discussion.